So hello everybody um, at the third e-online panel discussion at Aero 2020. As you all know, Aero has been cancelled like many other events around the world due to the coronavirus. Uh, over the last years with the eFlight Expo, we had a lot of uh, presentations, panel discussions from people who work in electric aviation around the world. Um, and uh, we had uh, uh, debuts like uh, the um, Volocopter, like Siemens aircraft, and like, uh, for example, Uber and many others. And what we uh, decided is we cannot be uh, all together, but what we can do is we can do it and record the information and you can have it online. So hello, hello to my panelists around Europe and hello to the visitors and viewers on the screen, wherever and whenever you, uh, you watch it. Uh, now we start, we have uh, here on the panel, we have uh, Hans Dunder from Green Flyway in Sweden, Eric Litun from Elfley in Norway, Martin Stefanik from Phoenix Aircraft in uh, uh, Czech Republic, and uh, Kin Ying from Rolls Royce Electric, Kin Ying Sang from Rolls Royce Electric here in Germany. And there are as well me and our the editor of uh, eFly Journal, Kin Ying uh, Xin Guo on the panel. So I think let's get started. I stop my screen sharing and then we see uh, the first presentation from Eric about what he thinks how electric aviation can develop in the Nordic countries. By the way, while Eric is getting his screen shared, you see on the image, the one with the mask uh, is Martin. He uh, joins us from the airfield uh, as he's doing some electric test flying. Luckily, they still can fly under special conditions in uh czech republic so uh but he will have time to talk and give out the latest info uh later on uh during this presentation okay eric uh, we waiting for your screen yeah it's coming great you see the right screen at the moment yes it's the right one perfect i will not touch anything then so hi my name is eric and i'm working uh, with um, electric aviation as um, as an investor and as a, as a, as a, as a personal interest, uh, I'm taking my pilot license, private flying pilot license, and I've ordered an electric uh, e-flyer two from uh, Bay Aerospace in the United States. And uh, then I started to doing business with them and uh, had, had uh, great uh, discussions with George Bay and his team, and we ordered 18 planes. So we are trying to position ourselves in Norway as a first mover and to do a business um, development around the possibility that will come with electric aviation. So to, to, to just give a quick uh, brief understanding about why we are doing this, I think everybody knows about the problem. I just read the recent report in um, from Avinur, which is uh, the Norwegian government's organization that is running 44 airports in Norway, that, uh, that the emission of CO2 in Norway, uh, approximately 5% is domestic flights. So they want to cut the emissions for Norway on uh, um, domestic flights by, to zero by 2040 and and why do you do we think in norway that this is a good idea norway was one of the first countries to highly uh, adapt to electric vehicles evs and uh, in 2090s electric vehicles is about 50 percent of the sale if you calculate also with um, hybrids and plug-in hybrids at the end of the year it's actually even more. If you see the green graph, graph here, uh, by um, the end of uh, 2019, you see that the, the, with you, if you add the, the, the slightly green and yellow one, which is plug-in hybrids and hybrids, you see that 
diesel and gas cars is about 20% now of the same. And after we've done this with the cars, we've started to do it with the ferries. So this is why I show the pictures of the ferries. In, uh, in the window here, you see uh, one of the first electric ferries that was built in the world. It's pure electric, takes 120 cars. And um, it's been operating for some years and it's been a, a great investment for the company that built it and is running it because of lower maintenance costs and uh, fuel costs. And this uh, last one here is a, a brand new one, which is for tourists. And it is a pure electric uh, vehicle ferry that is um, taking tourists around the fjords of Norway. So now the next challenge Norway will set forth to do is to have a zero emission aviation. And that's the hardest one. And um, we will try this to solve two, two problems in Norway. What, one problem is that we are, 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 are polluting with the CO2, but the other one is that we need to do business in Norway. Norway is a very long country, uh, which has um, a lot of people spread out to the north, uh, very far north. And that means that if they're going to do business there with the fishing industry, the salmon, uh, shipping industry, oil industry, and tourists, then you need to travel a lot. And uh, the roads are narrow and, uh, and, and, and it will take you a lot of time to travel around in Norway where we are doing business and living our life. So aviation is part of the infrastructure. So Norway has a very high use of aviation per capita. We are using aviation as we were 10 times more people in Norway. So we are 5 million people in Norway, but we are consuming aviation as we were 50 million people. And, and this is where the potential and opportunity is. If you see these uh, stars on this map over all the airports in Norway that Avinur is running, you see that the Trondheim Oslo, Bergen Oslo, Stavanger Oslo is uh, in 2015 was uh, top uh, of uh, the 11th routes in Norway with uh, consider a uh, number of people. And, um, and this is in and out of the main capital. And, and, the, and on, to add to that, we have all the other airports with a lot of traffic. So Norway, it's, uh, it's a market potential for relatively short flights with uh, lots of people and some people are traveling there for business a lot. So it, it means that you have a high, um, high possibility of people, but it, it, it's, uh, it's also hard to make money. So the government has something like subsidized routes that is giving out money to, to, to different companies, mm -hmm. primarily Vidara, mm -hmm. to, um, to, to fly. Mm -hmm. If you look at, um, at the numbers in, in Euro, uh, the, the Norwegian kroner has been changed a lot, so I'm not sure if these numbers are correct anymore. Uh, uh, but um, uh, in, in, in southern Norway, there is a, it's a four-year contract for seven routes, which is like uh, almost 60 million euros for a four-year contract. And for the north of uh, Norway, it's huge amount of money that, that Bidara can have from the government to, to fly these routes uh, on contract. So, so Vida, it's, it's, uh, it's doing a great job, but it's, uh, it's the one operator. And this is also the possibility to, uh, to come in for, for new technology and new players. So it will be interesting to see what electric aviation can, uh, can facilitate to, 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 to make this even better for Norway. Uh, and, and as an example of the route, which is not subsidized, I put up uh, Bergen, where I live, uh, this is Bergen here, uh, and um, Stavanger. And that's approximately uh, half a million people per year traveling up and down the coast. And, uh, and it's driving by car five to six hours. And you actually pass two other small airports on the way. So this is a perfect route for small electric planes to, to ship people really fast and efficient. It's... Um, it's interesting to see that, that, that there is a lot of short runways in Norway also, but we have a lot of runways. So we don't need a VTOL in Norway. Fixed wing will do the job in Norway. And, and that's, uh, 
something you can say um, we, we can have like um, a 19 seater which which could cover a lot of people neither of us smallest planes which they have 25 of is 39 seats so so I mean it's it's a lot of small air planes operating in Norway so electric aviation is definitely possible and, and, and we also have all the infrastructure as I'm talking about because because we have uh, a lot of short runways which is like uh, from 800 meters to 1200 meters so uh, they are spread all around the country and it's a really um, possibility to, to, to use them uh, for electric aviation and also the government has given out the report recently by Avinur and Luftfahrtstilsyvna that's like um, uh, Norwegian Civil Aviation Authorities CAA I think it's a, it's a report for um, for um, program for introduction of electric aviation for commercial air uh, air traffic in Norway and this came out uh, last month and it's a really interesting uh, report about what incentives Norway want to, to give to, um, to, to, to implement electric aviation. Um, I, would, I would just actually skip to that part. Uh, this is the, the, the reports like summarized in, electric, uh, in English. And, and one thing is that Norway wants to take a leading role as an arena for developing this technology and the market potential. And we have said that we will have by 2040 zero emission on all domestic flights. And we will reduce the 5% that we have of the total emissions by 80% for Norway. So, so there is a, a big, uh, uh, what do you say, the, the goal, it's a reach goal, but we will try to get it true. And we have uh, said that this is uh, two different areas, technology development, which is the hard part of getting certified planes and the tech to work. And, and, and you also have the thing to, 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 to get like uh, the different players on the field with the batteries management system, the engine, the airframes, and also the operators of, of aircrafts. And general aviation also for the smaller planes, which we try to order the 18 planes from uh, by aerospace to, to see what we can do with the Norwegian um, air, air, the different clubs that have uh, fractional ownership and different ownerships of planes. Um, yeah, and we, we are also a member of the Nordic Network for Electric Aviation, which also Hans is a member of, which uh, we have had some meetings and fine discussions about how we can do this for the Nor Nordic market, which is a big market in the global perspective. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the future work there with Hans and all the other people. So the key question is really who has a certified plane for Norway? I mean, we, we have the business case. Can somebody apply us with a certified plane that we can start to actually do business with here? That's, a, that's an interesting thing that I'm really excited about. Yeah, that was short for me. Uh, any, any questions or anything? Or we take that afterwards, uh, Will? Muting my microphone, yeah, just unmuting my microphone, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we take the questions afterwards. So I would like to see uh, Hans' presentation now, then King Ying's presentation, and then I think we go into the discussion, if this is okay with you. So Hans, if you could share your screen. Uh, I have a problem with that now, so, so I have to take it orally like this. Uh, to describe it and, and I, so what I would recommend is that, that um, when you are looking afterwards you will look upon our homepage yes. uh, which is greenflyaway.com then mm -hmm. you will find it in English uh, the, the presentation of the product and what we are doing and working with so I have to verbally now um, Describe. Actually, uh, Hans, actually what I will do, I will put this, uh, the homepage on the screen and then uh, uh, and I, uh, so the people can see it at the same time while you're talking, I think. Uh, it's green, flyway.com and then the people can see at the same time the, uh, the website, I think. Uh, I should be able to share the screen, uh, uh, which is this. 
uh, this screen now. And um, do you see the... Uh, no, yes. You see it? I see at least. Okay, then I think everybody should see. So you tell me if I should change anything, but now you can start explaining, I think, and then we see uh, how we go from there. Well, this uh, green flyway is a um, Swedish-Norwegian project, which is uh, a cross-border initiative, which is financed by a lot of partners. It's three years. Um, it's 20, 2021, 2022. And it's, we'll, we are actually going to develop a test arena for future aviation. And what we mean with future aviation in, in this matter, uh, electric aviation, but electric aircrafts, but also we will also work with, uh, you know, uh, drones. Uh, and we will also work with, um, well, air traffic management and use space. How do we combine uh, autonomous vehicles in the air with uh, non-autonomous uh, and uh, we also will work with how to green the the uh, infrastructure or greening of, of the airports uh, how do we become totally fossil free and how do we work with electricity and how do we work with the interfaces when, when we come to charging and so on how do we work with hydrogen uh, fossil well, sustainable air fuel, fuel uh, aviation fuels and so on uh, but and also re, uh, well, the ground support around this. We will be also working like one-stop shop, uh, inviting a lot of actors to come to, to our region to test their, their vehicles or their, their systems or, or their parts, uh, which will, uh, for instance, engines, uh, electric engines uh, or, or other kinds, but also entire aircrafts, both, both which are fixed wing aircrafts, but also um, you know, uh, electrical uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircrafts, as well as drones. And um, we, we have uh, a lot of partners in this project is, like I said, partly financed uh, by, by um, European Union, uh, an interreg project. Uh, and it's then it's the region of, of Jämtland, Heyerdalen, and also Trendelag's Filke, where in the mid Scandinavia or mid Nordic. And um, we, we are uh, also um, working with, so we have a look upon um, uh, how, how can electric uh, aviation be a disruptive technology which actually enhance regional uh, development by, by connecting uh, and, and um, connecting regions. Because we have the same problem in Sweden as well as in Norway, that we have, we are sparsely populated, we have long distances, uh, and uh, we had until the 80s uh, a relatively well developed um, regional uh, network for aircraft. Uh, well, uh, and and um, uh, and we we um, but due to the costs uh, for for uh, having you know uh, commuting with with small aircraft and turbine aircraft, and we have not the same PSO system like Norway, which is the public service obligation system. Uh, and it's not as developed as Norway. Uh, so therefore, the market forces have, have brought that out. So we have only the hub and spoke system, which is actually working uh, all over the world, so to say. We see here that, that electric aviation will make a big difference and it will be really destructive because, because of the um, possibility to, to achieve the same economy uh, with an, a 19-seater hot aerospace aircraft, elect fully electric aircraft, uh, on a short distance, like if you had an ATR uh, 70 or, or uh, these kind of 70 seaters or up to 100 seaters, and when you can have the same economy as them, and you can work with very small populations and very thin routes, um, and you do it in an economical way, we, we regard them, we will try to show that we will actually be able to do uh, electric buses of speedy speed bus connections it's, it's public transport in its right uh, meaning it's like trains and buses and so on but um, then this will be an electric bus with wings and and uh, how we can connect and for instance we have a uh, place in, in uh, the Jämtland uh, the region of Jämtland where we are, are working 
which is named Sveg, and then we have Östersund, which is the capital of, of the region, and the city center where you have all, all the, the universities, healthcare, and so on. But it's about 180 kilometers between these two points. And there are two airports, good airports actually, and, and, but it takes three hours going by bus or by train, and it will take about two hours to go by car, but it will take only 20 to 25 minutes to go by air. And therefore it's possible to commute, you know, within one hour from door to door. And we want to show that, so we are going to simulate that and, and just demonstrate that. And, and therefore we have, for instance, Hot Aerospace as a partner in our project. This aircraft will be up flying in 2022. So we hope that we can, we can use the prototypes and, and show really, that the, validate our uh, uh, calculations. But we start, um, and they will be up and running uh, with a certified aircraft in 2025, is their aim at least. And then we believe that that will be done. Um, and the Swedish government has now uh, realized this. So they are now putting two investigations uh, looking upon how electric flying could contribute to um, the, the um, aims that we have, that f we will have all domestic travel by air fossil free by 2030 and all traveling uh, including uh, international um, fossil free to 2045 um, to comp compare the, with the Norwegian goal that 2040 all domestic traveling should be by air should be electrified so in order to be able to do this you have to start somewhere and what we were the first we, we, we have this um, first actor that we had is that you see now in front of you is the Phoenix, which was the first out to test this, to fly up and down in December in winter conditions uh, in Sveg, which is part of the station, Sveg and Röros in Norway. Um, and they, they were showing, and I was actually fly, flying with Martin. Martin and I are the, the two guys who have been flying both the Pipistrel as well, the Alpha Electro and this aircraft, this Phoenix. Um, and um, it's a wonderful airplane, I can tell you. It's very nice to fly. I'm a private pilot myself. I'm sitting in the vice chairman of, of the Royal Swedish Air Club, working with air environmental issues and also accessibility issues. I'm a society planner by, by, by profession. So I'm working with well, infrastructure, both road, rail, and sea and air transport. And um, so that's, this is my, my, so to say, profession, but I'm a private pilot and I love flying. Uh, but we are, so we have started this and, and in, in um, February actually we had the, the second time we went with they flew from from Sveg to, to Hedlanda to, to Funestalen and then to to um, Röros um, as the first cross-country electric flying during winter time and and we are now having a dialogue with other actors who are wanting to put now electric propulsion and, and you know change the old Rotax versions for, for well, Blackwing for instance are having this dialogue we have others uh, EV tools we are, which we are discussing with uh, and other actors also which are looking upon the possibilities to test that their uh, equipment at, at our place and we, we have this um, believe that that we are now taking part in a well a game changing uh, it's a paradigm shift and, and um, we, our aim is to, to uh, assist this game shift, uh, shift and we, we are looking upon um, making this area of, of, of Norway and Sweden to become the test arena, uh, which is, uh, have the same um, status as, as the test arena in the very north of Sweden, which is Arjeplug and Arbitsjaur, where you have all the major car producers testing their vehicles during winter time. Because we have a lot of, of tough weather, tough topography, and, and so on, which is a must when you are testing things and see that show that it really works in tough conditions. Because if you can handle things in this area where we are, then you can tackle every kind of problem in, around the world, so to say. And and uh, so this is uh, how we work. And and we so we will as I try to describe now work together with uh, the Swedish um, airport, the governmental airport owner, which is Svedavia, and we are working together with the Norwegian, Nord uh, Avinor. We are working in the Nordic Network for Electric Aviation, and we work in electrification of Swedish uh, air traffic. 
which is another network. We are working together with Finns uh, because we look upon also the possibility to connect um, between the Nordic countries, not only between Oslo, Stockholm and Helsinki, but also between Trondheim, Östersund, Umeå and ba Vasa, for instance. And, and uh, to have cross connections in the middle and up in the bar north. And, and uh, by that, uh, using the, the, the relative advantage of, of uh, electric aviation as, as a game changer, the, the problem we have and will have in the beginning now is, of course, endurance. And, and therefore, you have to look upon relatively short lines where you can really make a difference. And, and um, so, so we have a PSO which is going from Östersund to Umeå on the east coast of Sweden. And, and um, this is uh, governmental uh, subsidized due to that we need, um, the people need to get a university hospital. And, and we see that will be one of the first uh, lines that we will use this electric aviation uh, as a line. But, but um, we also look upon how can we use EV tools and so on, not only for urban transport, but because we have not that dense urban, but for, for rural transport. Uh, and and um, how we can use it for what we call uh, blue light activities for the police, for the search and rescue, for the ambulance, but also for distributing medicine and whatever. Um, so, so that is a, in a kind of a nutshell, but we want, we want to take, be, make it possible for elect, well, uh, the aviation industry to, to show, well, first of all, develop, but then also to uh, test and also to, to then market uh, their products uh, and show that it will be uh, something which will be um, very interesting and also cost efficient and so on. And we are also trying to work now with rolling out a roadmap uh, for, for general aviation with electrification. I've been working very hard with the first uh, electric aviation uh, uh, well, uh, aircraft in the general aviation sector, which is bought by Sweden, uh, Aero Club of Sweden. And it will be now during summer, probably, that we will have our first uh, certified electric aircraft flying in an Aero Club in Sweden. That will be in Gothenburg this summer. It will, it will be a Pepistrel Velis Electro. Uh, and this is our all aim. That was a, some kind of a description. You, you can go further on and see all the partners who are there. But we have also, for instance, the CAA uh, and, and um, Civil Aviation Authority, which we are working closely to with. And we have also the air traffic management, um, like Luftfahrtswerke and Avinur with us. We have universities, we have Sintef and Research and, Res uh, well, and, um, not a, well, uh, uh, research and Development uh, Institution and institutions. Um, so so we, we are... Uh, <laughs> working hard with this and the, the first launching customer, so to say, is, is actually uh, the Pure Flight and, and uh, Phoenix. And you can see this, uh, you have YouTube films where you can f uh, follow this flight uh, from Sveg to Röros uh, when you go into the Green Flyway uh, area. And, and you can see a lot of interviews and such things, but in English, but in Swedish though. <laughs> but, but when you look at this, um, uh, flight uh, with, with on, on the uh, well uh, YouTubes, then it will be in English though. I could perhaps uh, answer questions. Yes. I could describe more, but I think it, this will be uh, a I short description of what we are working with. Thank you, Hans. And I think uh, we will have, like I said, the questions uh, afterwards. So now we heard two uh, kind of players in the two most active countries in the North talking about electric, which are Sweden and Norway. So perhaps now, uh, Kinging, you could unmute your phone and share your screen. I unshare my screen uh, again. And then we could hear because uh, Kin Ying is working for uh, Rolls-Royce Electrical and at Rolls-Royce Electrical he actually took over or better you explain it to us what you're doing there I think it's better than if I describe what you're doing um, so we have the right screen but you have to unmute your phone still because we don't hear you Jin Ying? 
It's, there is a button at the left uh, corner of the of the screen. Now it's unmuted. Yes, and yeah. now please change to the other screen again yeah. because now we see your working screen. Okay. Great. Yes. Okay. Perfect. My name is Xin Zhang. <laughs> okay. Uh, as uh, really introduced, I'm working for Rolls Royce Electrical. Uh, actually, we were our uh, department of Siemens uh, called Siemens E-Aircraft. We've been taken over by Rolls-Royce um, in October last year. So um, my role at uh, Rolls-Royce Electrical is um, responsible for the business area commuter. And same time, I also have the technical responsibility, for example, acting as a project coordinator of our, this EU-funded um, EU funded pro research project called ELICA, Electric Innovative Commuter Aircraft. And within this project, we perform uh, different various studies, starting from market research to uh, aircraft design. And the goal of this uh, project is, uh, as described by the tender, is to deliver our um, PDR uh, preliminary design uh, reviews um, stage aircraft design um, with near zero emission. And so um, I would just go through this pr uh, presentation because it, it's uh, quite uh, what we have, what you have talked is, for example, the economic feasibility of such a aircraft and market um, accessibility. And maybe one aspect is also from the technology, technology point of view, um, Will this kind of uh, electric commuter aircraft work at all? So I just use this project presentation to give you such a uh, give you an idea about uh, the technological visibility. Okay, so the objective of the um, this project is to deliver a concept design of a ninety pax commuter aircraft, which is. Um, defined within the CS23. Um, the, the, it describes the upper boundary of such a um, commuter aircraft, which can be certified under this uh, CS23 rule. Um, what we are doing here is we try to deliver our low emission um, concept. And we, we will provide a commuter aircraft design, which is uh, first of all, environmental friendly, and then um, to, to, to give it a product perspective, it should of course also be economic, economically feasible uh, and technological innovative, that's our goal. And uh, why we think this kind of aircraft is quite essential for the electrification strategy is, once we developed such kind of a uh, design platform for this 90-seater um, aircraft, we can easily downscale it to, for example, four-seater, 11-seater aircraft, which belongs to, for example, to the Technum um, aircraft portfolio, or we can also upscale it uh, to the Leonardo or ATR aircrafts with 50-seater uh, and 70-seater. So that's basically the uh, motivation behind this. And since it's a EU-funded project, of course, uh, the goal is also to strengthen the EU position in the global race for such kind of uh, uh, electrification of regional mobility. So we have a just short description of the project consortium. Uh, in the lead is the Rolls-Royce Electrical. Um, located in Germany, we have various uh, experience from the past. For example, we brought the extra 330 LE aircraft into the year uh, into the air in the year 2016 already and in this year another uh, world record breaking uh, aircraft is going to be uh, airborne which is called Excel and in the consortium we have very strong partner like the University of Napoli uh, Naples which uh, has extensive industrial experience by uh, their collaboration with Technam and Leonardo. They have both numerical um, capabilities and also wind tunnel hardware. 
for simulation. And SmartUp and Airspace are two different uh, startups. Um, SmartUp is uh, specialized in, error, in computational simulation and optimization uh, environments. And um, Airspace is um, a startup which deliver our silent air, deliver the silent air taxi concept with a four packs uh, commuter aircraft for the regional air mobility. Uh, last but, but not least is the Siemens industrial software which provides a lot of uh, software solutions um, accompany the product life cycle. So uh, starting from digital twin to manufacturing softwares and also within this consortium they are developing an innovative electric architecture design tool which will set um, which has an in the loop failure to, um, failure mode analysis so that you, you can be sure the architecture solution will satisfy the certification rule with certain failure rate. And uh, this project also has a very strong industrial advisory board that's Leonardo Aircraft, Technam, Piaggio, and Evector from different uh, European countries. Actually, uh, all the propeller, bigger propeller aircraft manufacturers are here present. Okay, so I'll go to the next point is, uh, as I stated at the beginning, the project is quite comprehensive. And it starts with a market analyze, which is also quite good follow up uh, to the presentation of Eric and uh, Hans. Uh, so if we look at the regional air mobility, are we sure that uh, once we deliver uh, our air taxi, um, air taxi aircraft design, well, it has a market potential. So there's, there are tools for the transportation system analysis that can analyze different um, transport means. By the way, do you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. So um, if you discretize the whole European continent and um, divided the um, geographical Europe into discreted points, so each point has a population density. It has a access, a, you can use open source data bank. For example, for the uh, open street map, you can then determine its um, accessibility via road and uh, the accessibility via uh, train. So the road um, accessibility is for example, marketed like uh, yellow train is, um, blue and the commercial aircraft is marked as green. So the logic behind this color map is, if you start from Aachen and you want to go to another place in Europe, for example, let's say Madrid, um, then the, the transportation system analyze can provide uh, our solution. So how much time you would need with car and how much time you would need with train and how much time you would need with the commercial airline. And um, if you have an air taxi concept, how much time it would, it would take you with the air taxi. So based on this analysis, uh, just like, like I said, if you take the example of Aachen to uh, Madrid, you were for sure, <clears throat> it's a distance maybe 800 kilometer, for sure you would take the commercial airline. Um, and, but if you are moving or um, traveling, in the vicinity of Aachen, you probably the most probable uh, transportation mean would be the car. So this kind of analysis is visualized here. And for our city like uh, Milano, you can uh, also plot the uh, travel frequency or the um, probability that you're going to use, which kind of transportation mean you are going to use uh, into a line plot. So dependent on the distance from zero to thousand kilometer, um, this is more or less also basic logic. That means for a distance below 100 kilometer, you would take the car, which is yellow. And then for um, distance above 500 kilometer, the, uh, you probably you are for sure take the commercial airline. Um, and then dependent on the, on the train 
or rail infrastructure, you have certain probability that you will take the train. Uh, obviously, in Milan, uh, the train infrastructure is not that developed. Um, so you, you will see a market gap somewhere between 100 and 500 kilometer. And our air taxi, which utilizes the local airfield, can perfectly fill this gap. So, um, and also, this is just an analyze from, from Milan. And if you uh, see again on the Europe map, you can identify the, the same trend. So if you travel from Aachen westward to Brussels, it takes you one hour. So very, um, you would, would like to take the train. Even for London, you see here this blue dot. So if you take the Eurostar, uh, probably that's the most preferred transportation need. However, if you go to, into the east world, where, for example, the road is not, infrastructure is probably not well developed, and also the train uh, um, also not. So um, especially then, you would have a quite big probability, um, probability that you'll take such kind of new developed air taxi. So that's a basic uh, market analyze behind it. Second step, once you say, okay, there will be a market potential. Um, so in this case, we, we chose uh, Germany for the first analyze and you will see we will also perform analyze for Scotland and for, also for Norway. Um, what you see here is uh, Germany has altogether 400 airports and airfields. They are international airports. It's the dark square. You have domestic airports uh, in three angles, and you have a lot of CS23 general aviation airfields. It's quite densely distributed. And in this plot, you see here the percentage of uh, airfield in relation to their runway lengths. For example, uh, for runway length for airports featuring runway lengths above two kilometers, you only have less than 10% of the overall airport and airfields number in Germany, which is logical. You only have international airports possibly which has longer runway than two kilometers. And if you go below, uh, if you see here, uh, you reach almost 100% of all airfields has a runway length more than around, let's say 500 meter. And we believe, for example, for a 90 seater commuter aircraft, probably you would uh, need 800 kilometer, uh, sorry, 800 meter of runway. Uh, in that case, you can, you can access with such kind of commuter aircraft, you can access 40% of all German airfields. So that is, for example, one of the design parameter which we can choose. So um, if we want to access 50% of the airfield, we would choose the uh, maximum takeoff length uh, for 800 meter. And another plot here you see here is um, for this kind of, um, for this 50% of airfields, you can also um, plot the population distribution for Germany. You will see then, here is a uh, distance to such kind of air, uh, airports uh, is plotted from five to 40 kilometers. And here is a population in Germany. So I just shortened it up. So within 20 kilometer of such kind of airfield, you can access 55% of the German population. So uh, the more population you can reach within, the, uh, within a short distance, the more potential customers you will be, um, you will be able to access. So, um, yeah. so this gives us a confirmation about the market potential of such our aircraft. And the same analyze, of course, you can, once you establish the analyze framework, you can um, deliver the same analyze for Europe with, you see here that uh, all the distribution of airfields in the whole Europe, and even we can also extend the analyze for the world. Um, so we just, just pick two uh, special countries, which are promising one, let's say, uh, also Eric identified it, uh, probably says home country 
by uh, accidentally. Um, Norway, <laughs> um, he al already analyzed the Oslo to Trondheim and Os all the um, short haul uh, distances. We totally agree with Eric, Norway, uh, Norway people are really like to uh, enthusiastic in flying. So, and also they have a lot of quite busy uh, routes in Europe and on very short distances below, I think 400 kilometers. So this is really, from this point of view, uh, really promising uh, country to have electric commuter aircraft applied. Another interesting, um, interesting country is uh, UK, especially Scotland, uh, Scotland, with distributed islands and also with airport on it. Uh, lastly, I found they also um, want to zero emission aviation to the year two, uh, 2040, so they can be a um, geographical competitor to Norway to have a, uh, establish a zero emission uh, aviation. So within this project, as I said, we, one aspect is market analyze. Uh, second one is uh, technology. And we want to s identify the technology enabler, how we can uh, make the new aircraft more efficient utilizing the electric propulsion. It can be, it's the switch from piston engine to turbine engine led to paradigm uh, change in the aircraft design. Uh, the, the, cha the modification is similar uh, order of magnitude can be, could be expected for the electrification. Uh, and due to the compact form of electric propulsion unit, you can think about distributed electric propulsion and within the consortium, it's quite important that we know we have the, um, the uh, appropriate tools to capture such effect. So University of Napoli started their analyze and analyze distributed electric propulsions. They detected if a propeller on you will have an increase in CL max and we, are in, uh, we have different if you have different distributed electric propulsion units from A to 20, you can capture the effect. Just to sum it up, um, if you have even more, does not mean you will, uh, the, the configuration will deliver more because at some point it will worsen the efficiency due to the small propeller. So actually, if you see here, the maximum effect can be seen by 16 distributed electric propulsion and so on. So we are confident we have the tools to capture this kind of effects. And also another uh, case study showed uh, also for this kind of if, uh, aircraft, they, their tool can capturing and analyze and optimizing the aircraft design. So this, uh, and then from the aircraft, you go one level lower, you would come to the electrical powertrain. So that's uh, the domain of Rolls-Royce Electrical. So uh, the design challenge uh, is uh, our coordination on system, subsystem, and equipment level. And you need to trade, and you must follow our holistic optimization approach. So uh, let's say if you have a propulsion system design, you will need to consider the um, system architecture. You will, need, you, will be, you will need to ensure that the systems can be certifiable um, due to the failure rate and no single failure should lead to total loss of the system. And, and all this are supported by the equipment design. So on the machine level, you have other design objectives. That means you want to have a very power dense uh, e -machine, electric machines, high efficiency, high safety, and easy to integrate uh, equipment. So the, the whole um, the optimization of the electric uh, powertrain should start from the architecture to the equipment. And we have the, uh, within this consortium, we have the uh, uh, appropriate tools to do that. For example, as an example is, for example, Siemens uh, industrial software is developing our automatic system architecture analyze tool. You can easily detect 
the failure um, failure probability already in the very early design stage so that you can be sure if you have analyzed thousands uh, of possible um, architecture solutions and you already detect their potential failure probability so you can then concentrate on our much less number of architecture solution uh, proposals uh, proposed solutions uh, and concentrate on detailed design here so um, you see here the failure rate is around 10 to the power of minus 8, which is, uh, could satisfy uh, the certification rule. Okay, and then you have from the system architecture, you have the EPU uh, level. That means EPU we means it's a like, so-called subsystem, which consists of an electric machine, inverter, and even cable. Um, on this level, we also have the analyze and optimization tool uh, to shorten it up. We have used this uh, tool for the center line project. It's a passenger aircraft with eight megawatt propulsion power. And we, one finding is, for example, the, work, um, the cable weight can be very dominant. It's even more than half of the system weight, let's say 65%. And if you choose the accordant voltage level to, for example, to 2000 volt, you can significantly reduce the cable weight so that the, you reach our um, system optimal. Okay, here what you can see is the system uh, Pareto front. Um, we currently, we are adapting this tool to uh, the commuter aircraft. What you see here is a Donier 228. We have uh, performed a whole architecture design loop for this kind of aircraft. Um, we, uh, the goal was to replace the left propulsion unit, the, uh, the turboprop engine with an electric propulsion unit with batteries and generator on it. And we already finished the first concept design. Okay. So then with all the tools and components we I just showed and we have still our aircraft preliminary design environment. Uh, this is again the University of Napoli. Uh, you can perform uh, first design and then consider in the regulation constraints, powertrain equations, equations, weight estimation, and then perform the flight mechanics design to ensure it has an accordant performance, uh, which is in line with the top level aircraft requirements and so on. So then you can perf you can get different aircraft uh, experimental concepts and analyze their performance. So we already have some intermediate results, but I want to just skip it for this uh, discussion. And then thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that's very interesting, I think, and I think it's a good add-on because when we talk about the market potentials in Norway, we sure also have to talk about um, uh, what w is uh, possible on the technical side. And I already have several questions on Jinying. Um, uh, but uh, before we go to the question, perhaps we give Martin a quick chance of um, uh, giving us some explanation on his aircraft, which is the Phoenix, which uh, was flying in Sweden and Norway recently and uh, see where this aircraft is because like uh, Hans was explaining this could be or will be one of the first aircraft flying on the Norwegian market as most of you know there are um, perhaps Jinying, if you stop sharing the screen I then could put in while Martin is talking because I think he cannot share his screen uh, I could share some images of the flying in Norway and you could give us some uh, explanation Martin Okay, hello. Uh, I hope you hear me. I am maybe I can remove it now because I'm alone in the oops <laughs> in this building. We are on the airfield. Sorry, we have been supposed to fly today, but uh, weather is not so not so good and uh, and temperature is really low. So, how what to say about our airplane? Uh, in 2010, uh, we had a dream to make uh, electric plane, and because because we didn't know it, that is difficult we just did it and 
well, I don't know if we would start it again, <laughs> if, we, if we know what we know now. But uh, it's really challenging. And uh, finally, the final version of Phoenix has uh, already very interesting parameters. So uh, we've been able to make uh, very, very nice flight testing in uh, Sweden and Norway. And I really have to say thank you a lot to Hans and his team because they allowed us and they helped us uh, to, to obtain uh, the permission to fly in Sweden and Norway. Uh, actually, uh, we also obtained permission to fly on International Airport, Airport Bromma, where we did a very, very nice presentation and we've been flying over Stockholm. It was, it was really something uh, unforgettable. Uh, and about technical parameters, uh, we have 35 kilowatt hour batteries, which allows us to fly for two and a half hours with some small safety reserve. Uh, I'm normally flying about two hours. For one very charge, we are flying we can do over 10 takeoffs uh, with two persons aboard. So we are, I can say, at the beginning of the chain uh, of the where you have uh, big uh, airplanes, like 20 seaters, then you have four seaters. So we are at the beginning with our small two seater, which is, uh, I think, uh, suitable for, for private uh, electric flying, uh, sport flying, maybe also training. Uh, the idea was that uh, even if uh, we are not aiming to to do all the time the, the maximum length flights like like two and a half hours uh, because the one thing is to to have a plane which is able to do it and second thing is to have uh, some like um, that is the idea to to make the lifetime of the batteries as long as possible and to make it as long as possible to achieve this goal you cannot use the battery from zero to 100% all the time. Ideally, of course, you are recharging to 100%, but then you, then you discharge up to, let's say, 20, 30%, and then you start charging again. You don't go to zero. So actually, after one year of flying, I can say that it's working perfectly. I enjoy every minute in the air. We have now over 100 hours. Uh, to make it universal, we did uh, we followed the system which we used on Rotax version, which has a removable wing extension, so you can fly as a normal plane with 10.6 meter wingspan up to the motor glider uh, 15 meters. In future, also 17 meters wingspan. You can change it very very easily. It takes you two three minutes to change one plane to the other because the wing extensions are very light and easy to be. Uh, to be exchanged and uh, in uh, during the flight um, from Sweden to Norway <laughs> that's a good picture during the flight from Sweden to Norway we we found out that uh, you really have to be very careful uh, with the infrastructure uh, it's good to to check uh, the availability of uh, what what power is available on the airfields and uh, also if the cables are properly wired because uh, we could make the flight direct uh, from Sveg to, to Roros, which is 170 kilometers. But we wanted to try the landing on the ice and snow and uh, all special conditions, which we don't have in Czech Republic. So we landed on ice runway. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the first one. But then we landed on the frozen lake, where is no runway, this is just a lake, and our friends uh, they prepared beautiful, beautiful runway that we've been able to land there. But unfortunately, they supply the energy from the cable, which has by mistake connected zero to sorry one phase to the zero. So we burned our <laughs> our charger. And the last, most challenging part of the flight over the mountains between Sweden and Norway, uh, with really hard crosswind, we did uh, with not fully charged battery. We had only 70% battery charge and a lot of headwind, but still we did it with 30% uh, reserve. And then I did one more flight in Norway. So I have to say that this plane uh, is not, of course, uh, aiming to big transportation. Maybe we could make a bigger version with four seater, but, but I don't definitely believe we are able to make some like a 20 seater plane. <laughs> However, we have to start somewhere. And uh, uh, even pilots, they have to start to understand that electric propulsion, even if you want to do, do it very similar 
to, um, let's say, combustion propulsion, like with Rotax, it will never be exactly the same. You, you really have to be, you have to watch a little bit different parameters. You must explain pilots uh, how the system works. And if they know, they also are prepared uh, for what can happen. Uh, as I mentioned it, we started in 2010. So first flight we, well, two-seater electric plane we did in 2011. And uh, I have to say it was, every year was challenge, some challenge. So finally I can say we are at a point where, where I'm taking people, I'm showing people how beautiful it is to fly with electric propulsion. And nobody's complaining about, uh, about noise, which is great. Uh, what was interesting, uh, maybe it's interesting, I can say, yesterday we've been uh, assembling something with my children on the, in the garden and, and I saw one plane flying around, it was ultralight, whatever, with Rotax, and I found out that uh, because now with coronavirus issue there, are no fly, there is no flying in Czech Republic practically, that even this started to be a little bit disturbing, that when you, when you listen the the silence, where it's practically very limited traffic, even on the ground and in the air is no traffic, and you see one plane flying around your house, you find out that it would be less loud, and it's not loud plane, but it's, if it's less loud, you will appreciate it. So I think that this uh, situation, what is now happening worldwide, will step-by-step step change uh, also the aviation, not the big aviation, uh, which of course will be affected by uh, no tourists practically uh, for an, another maybe one year. But uh, also for the local people, because now when they, when they, they cannot hear anything from the, from the sky and it will start again flying with all these outer gyros and, uh, and, and whatever uh, ultralights, I think that it will be more and more demand for, for very silent uh, planes and also uh, for very silent planes flying the training. So that's my point of view and that's our, that's our experience. I will not make it so longer. If you have any questions about our okay. plane, I will be very happy to answer. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, this gives, now we have had very nice uh, parts of the game, which all have to come together when we want to get flying and where we've seen that Norway can be a good market for such a, a first user. But on the other hand, it will be uh, one thing which uh, is also feasible in a lot of different countries. So as challenge and as motivation for those people working on aircraft, um, Norway can be the first market because due to the special situation, also Sweden, uh, the whole Nordic area could be the first uh, easy use case. And if you see the challenges you have there with the, uh, with the cold, where even the car manufacturers go there for testing their vehicles, I think it is a very good test case. And because if it worked there, it's most probably also working in other parts. And we've seen there is a market also in other parts of the world, even in Germany, where you have a very large, good, work of uh, streets and railway better than in most parts of the world. Uh, so I think there is a very good market there. So uh, some addition you've seen before uh, to the presentation of Hans, uh, what he said about the flying of uh, Martin in, uh, Nor in the Nordic countries. Uh, you can see the videos uh, on YouTube already. Uh, we will have a story on our magazine, eFly Journal, and in German on Flügel in the very near future, let's say in one or two weeks. So when you're still locked up with Corona at home, you can't get flying, you can get to YouTube and get some very interesting information there. And with this, I leave it open for questions from all of you. Um, and uh, yeah, so perhaps uh, ask questions. I have a lot of questions, but I'll leave you as my guests the first choice. Eric and Skin Ying, you're both muted still. So if you want to ask questions, uh, just uh, for information. So no question, then I may ask the first question, which I have to Skin uh, um, Ying. Uh, when you've done the study on the 19-seater, 
uh, and you said you also studied the technical feasibility. Um, do you think with nowadays batteries, it is possible to achieve a 19 seater who could cover these distances which we have mentioned, let's say distances up to, 100, let's say 200, between 200 and 300 kilometers. Would this be possible with technology right now or uh, especially looking at the battery? Or do you think um, we will have to start with smaller aircraft fast before? Um, especially for 90 seater, um, that's a, uh, tender which uh, the European mm -hmm. Commission issued. Um, we studied the 90-seater for electric version. I think the achievable range will be in the below 200 kilometer. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you need still to think about the uh, IFR reserve and also the uh, loiter, uh, required loiter, possibly uh, duration mm -hmm. and so on. And then the range is quite limited. Um, on the other hand, um, if you go to smaller aircraft, um, you can also carry less. So uh, currently we're also assessing the, um, the feasibility of a nine-seater, nine-pack aircraft, for example, how it will look like. And so on. this study is still ongoing. When you say nine packs, aircraft will, would need 11 seater, let's say nine passengers plus crew, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I have a question to Eric because, like, do you think when you would say, okay, because the, the other thing is if you have a large aircraft, you always have to get enough people who want to travel. Uh, and especially in Norway, where you said there are not so many people and a lot of locations. Would you think a smaller aircraft than a 19-seater? As we heard, a 19-seater can be quite difficult to realize with nowadays technology. And what batteries are promising uh, is one thing, but what is feasible and certifiable is another thing. So do you think when you would take additional landing strips, they could be more feasible routes with smaller aircraft in Norway? Well, on the list of uh, the 44 airports that Avinov operates, the shortest one is 820 meter. That is by far the shortest one. But, but, uh, but uh, 800 meter plus runways, they have a lot in Norway. So if you go b below that, there are even more airports around uh, different locations with small populations. So if it's possible to do an air taxi-ish kind of service with uh, an 11-seater airplane, I think that would be a beautiful case. And the government of Norway have said that the, the transportation system will be neutral compared to, there will be zero emission as the goal, but it will be neutral if you take a train, a ferry, a car, or a, a plane, as long as it's just neutral in carbon emissions. And they have in this report a lot of um, possibilities for uh, grants and uh, subsidization of organizations that want to buy electric aviation as first movers. They also want to do um, subsidizing of tickets and things for passengers for the, the first electric aviation vehicles. So maybe for 11 seaters, there will be even bigger business opportunities in Norway because that market doesn't exist today. So maybe in the future, not 50 million people will fly in Norway per year. It will be 100 million. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Hans, yeah. Do you have what? What about Sweden in this area? Well, yes. This this is also one of these issues because until now, uh, air well, air transport has been regarded something uh, different from from train transport, bus transport, car transport. Uh, but what we're working on now is trying to, to well, make them equal, so to say, and say that uh, electric um, propulsion can make it, make that air, air transport could be regarded as, as much as collective transport, like, like trains and buses. And, and uh, we also see that, that we can, for instance, with the uh, um, Alice Evian, for instance, that's a nine-seater 
uh, which have the capacity to do, go for a uh, hundred kilometers, uh, well, um, well, yes, uh, thousand kilometers. Uh, and that that uh, would be of, of great interest for a lot of, of different routes. So, and um, so we see that there's a large potential of going not only to hubs, but to fly from point to point uh, and do this in a very specific way. And there is now this issue in Sweden that the Swedish government also is looking upon. Uh, how can we contribute? How can we work with this? Can we use this as a tool to in enhance accessibility? Because a large, well, a lot of, of, of regional development is based upon how accessible you are and, and what you can reach, and therefore, and, and in a relatively cost-efficient way, but also must be environmental-friendly way. And, and so, therefore, we, we look upon this. That, I mean, we have um, ten governmental-owned airports, and we have thirty regional, thirty-three actually. But then we have 160 airport, or airfields rather, that which are owned by, by regions, uh, well, the municipalities and aero clubs or private airports, ports, which are normally 800 meters or something like that. And, and um, so we could really open up also in Sweden. And, you know, for instance, this hot aerospace, uh, they, they have the, their idea is to optimize it for being able to fly for 750 meters. Mm -hmm. airfields that means all the the short fields in norway but also in sweden actually so 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 um this is something that we look upon but what we see there are some obstacles now of course is the battery the batteries and certified batteries another thing is the infrastructure you we have to come to a standard how to re to charge i mean in the car sector we have the standards which is european the ccs2 which is speed uh, well speed uh, charging uh, or fast charging, and we will have to find some kind of that. And we uh, I had a dialogue with with um, Hart Aerospace uh, last week. They, they, I was asking them, what, what standard do you look upon? Uh, and and uh, they are looking upon the CCS2 with one megawatt, megawatt of capacity, uh, and which is for the the heavy truck market actually, for, for, uh, and. Uh, so that to be able to utilize the same, but we have to have a standard. And we in the Nordic countries, we were the first to implement the NNT system for mobile telephones and then GSM and becoming a practical standard. So one of our issues here also in the Nordic countries here is to perhaps to put up the factual standard for, for electric aviation also, mm -hmm. because we have to deal with that. And that is one part that we are going to deal with in our project, how, how to, well, uh, be able to, to service um, and, and also have charging and finding the good solutions for charging. Perhaps one remark to this, which is interesting. I don't know if you have contact already with GAMA, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, because I think they have a strong initiative also working on this standardization. And there are all the German, uh, General Aviation Manufacturers located in there, and they have a very core interest in there. So. Perhaps you definitely should connect with them when you work on this effort. And I have another question on uh, Qingying. Do you know um, on this charging uh, site, is Rolls-Royce taking efforts there in working towards a standardization? Mm, I have no comment on that. I'm Actually, I'm not familiar with the okay. business, so I hold back my comments. Sorry for that. Uh, no, no problem. Um, so I can say one, one, one comment on the charging standard thing. One thing that the authorities of Norway discovered when they, they, they in Norway now there is 74 electric ferries being built or being in operation already. And one thing they discovered now with so many ferries put in production is that when they wanted to try to move one ferry from one route to another, then the operator said, well, they uh, have the wrong kind of charging system, so we cannot move the ferry. And, and that is something they discovered now, that there are not a standard for the ferries, so they want to try to implement now for aviation to, to get like one standard-ish kind of thing. So actually, they don't have to build dual and triplet systems to dis support different kind of vehicles. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I um, actually, yeah. Yeah. Ah, no, I, I, I just have a quick, okay. Um, actually, I just have one quick uh, follow-up um, question. 
or Chen Yin. Uh, actually, this is a kind of a follow-up question to your previous uh, question and also for uh, Eric and Hans uh, comments. The question is, um, Chen Yin, uh, um, does your project or any other project that you know um, study the economical feasibility of um, the electric commuter? The point is how many uh, seats will be the minimum to uh, make the operator profitable? Because I think uh, to make this electric commuter uh, prevail, the operators must be profitable, and that the uh, the, prof the profitability of this uh, air taxi is uh, directly related to uh, the number of seats. And that's why we see over the years, all these regional airlines or air taxi operators, they tend to use uh, larger and larger airplanes because uh, the cost per seat per mile could be lower. So I think uh, uh, to the best of knowledge, do you have any such uh, like number, for example, uh, like, a f uh, uh, like a what's a minimum of seats could be profitable for electric commuter, let's say six or eight or, or even four? Uh, you know, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, I'll pick up that, that first. Um, actually, the tender uh, for the pro uh, project was uh, explicitly prescribed that it should be a 90s tax commuter aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we, indeed, we developed our, also our cost model for, this, mm -hmm. for the operation of the aircraft. And currently, we believe this kind of uh, aircraft can be operated at a price of 55 cent per passenger kilometer. So okay. it's, it's in the range of the uh, cars and um, other uh, transportation means. Um, so it can be profitable because we are not only competing with the aircrafts, bigger aircrafts, especially on a short distance, also with cars, with trains and so on. Um, that's our probably even more competitive than the bigger airplanes. And the effect, what you said before, uh, that uh, airlines um, are going to use large and large aircraft. That's true to reduce cost, but it has its li limits because you can only fly or approach to um, to larger airports. And what we are doing here is we, we want to utilize the regional airfields. Um, then you have you need other kind of aircrafts. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, answer. Yeah. Uh, we we have um, this is part of our project also to to me measure this or or to to make these kind of, of, of simulations and and we look definitely upon this as as a possibility. This is why we were and we are at, actually at this moment. I was last week talking with Anders Forslund about the hard aerospace and the cost for for operating them and so on. There is a Finnish professor who has done this and compared. With, with the ATRs and so on. Um, and uh, so we will do it in our project. And I was doing, because this test flight that, that uh, this Phoenix was doing, Martin was doing, he, he, well, he, he described, and you can see it on our homepage, how, many, how much uh, energy it consumed. Uh, and um, also the flight which was taking place in Broma was the same thing. A uh, quarter an hour it was uh, consuming three kilowatt hours of battery capacity, and that would have been 10 liters of air gas to a price of, of, of 20 euros, while the, the cost of, of Martin's flying was below one euro. Uh, it was one third of a euro, actually, for, for the an, an energy cost. And so we, but we tried also, I've done that now to calculate and show, the, well, compare the, the Martin, uh, the Phoenix uh, was flying from, from um, the Sveg to Röros. Uh, during this way, it was 22 km, uh, 220 kilometers, uh, the way they flew, and, and um, you know, as they were not flying directly. Uh, but it was actually the same road, that is the, the road transport also. So we have been comparing now uh, the Martin's uh, electric aviation or aircraft, the Phoenix. We also compared it with the, the same aircraft but with an, a Rotax engine and also with an electric vehicle like a Tesla, but also a diesel uh, vehicle and, and also a petrol driven vehicle. And, and we can easily see that the, the, um, the, the, the one which really consumes less um, or actually uh, is very cost efficient is the Phoenix. 
So it's a lot of, then it's a question about how much does the battery cost to change and so on. So we are doing these kinds of calculations. We will come up with them, uh, but I have them on my, well, in my computer at the moment, <laughs> in an Excel sheet, uh, and, and uh, we are going to deliver the coming months uh, a lot of figures around this. But it is, um, it is possible, and uh, it's also a question, of course, of the cost of investment in these aircrafts and the infrastructure, but um, actually it's relatively, easy to put up the infrastructure for these 200 airfields if you compare it with other infrastructure that is built. I think one point you mentioned there is one thing where what I want to ask uh, Martin. Uh, I hope he's hearing as he's walking around. You're hearing us? Martin? Yes, I hear you. I only okay, have to good. walk to my car uh, because I have battery 2%, so I yeah. have to find some charger quickly. Uh, yeah, no. I, uh, so I, I just want to say, talking about huh? battery, it's a good, good word because um, you built this electric aircraft, and uh, there is one of the challenges uh, I think you told me is getting the right and the good batteries and getting the batteries at a reasonable price. So, exactly. um, uh, how much did the battery, you know, when you calculate? just how much the aircraft, not how the sales price is, but how much the aircraft to build could you and how much percentage of this was a battery or what, what price was the battery for this aircraft? Well, if I, if I remember well, uh, the, we paid over 1000 euros per one kilowatt hour. So the battery was uh, about over 40,000 euros only the battery. Yes. And the uh, whole plane uh, as we build it uh, with all the stuff, was around, sorry, I have to start the engine. <laughs> ah, no, it's better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was uh, 220,000 euros with all the charges and everything. Mm. So, but I, I believe that uh, the if you compare to automotive, when they say they are around, I don't know, I don't want to say something wrong, but it was 200 US dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. So there is a really, really huge possibility to get better prices, but of course we are, I would not say even small producer in compare with others, we are probably micro producer. So uh, to have a possibility to buy uh, these uh, batteries cheaper somehow would be, would be definitely big help. So this is perhaps uh, one idea for the initiatives you have up there in Norway, like you have a lot of electromobility there on the, in the, on the sea and on the land. You know, working on this, getting a, 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 trying to get battery production or producent working with aircraft manufacturers and supplying batteries at a lower rate could really accelerate the whole process. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Well, you know, uh, again, you know, we are aiming more to, uh, to sport flying or let's say it's maybe also training. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, uh, I suppose, uh, also intensive use uh, or in aeroclubs. Yeah. And this uh, for, for the aeroclubs will be, of course, I don't know how it's going in, uh, in the Nordic countries, but for example, European aeroclubs, they have limited sources. Uh, also, the interest for uh, aeroclub uh, like membership is not that large as in the past. And I believe that... Uh, the showing that uh, also flying can be environmental friendly can, let's say, increase interest in young between young people because now as they are um, affected uh, by, um, let's say, uh, uh, opinions that uh, uh, flying is uh, very, let's say, uh, making a lot of pollution and CO2, etc. Uh, this can show them that that is not that true and then uh, is even opening the new challenges that, for example, if we have plane with the same battery, they can uh, compete each other, how long they can stay in the air, etc. You know, it's... it's there is a new world like, when you mention this, you're probably going and your aircraft is a ki kind of electric motor glider. So uh -huh. I think uh, gliding, apart from training, gliding and glider clubs can be the first customers for electric uh, aircraft, electric motor gliders. So in the Nordic countries, Hans, do you know in Sweden, Norway, how many glider pilots or glider clubs you heard there who, who potentially could be one of the first interested people? 
well, in, in Sweden, we have uh, the, we are decreasing both in, in, in uh, not, not um, the uh, numbers of aero clubs, but but in, in members due to that we are having aging aircrafts and aging uh, pilots and so on, and mm -hmm. only male pilots almost there are less than ten percent which are female. So so and the population is fifty fifty sort of. So. But we have seen now that, that electric aviation is making. Well, it's actually making a real difference. It attracts women, it attracts young people. So that we think it, this will be something which is of great importance because for instance, we had in the 1990s, we had six and a half thousand pilots in Sweden, three and a half thousand aircrafts. We are now down to three and a half thousand pilots and 1500 aircrafts. We will continue this. We will, in the thirties, we will be well wiped out, so to say, uh, and we have to, to do something against this and therefore we see this is really a change game changer also for aero clubs uh, we will attract new generations and also the female population and this is of great importance for our survival in the long term um, we and we say this but the, the same thing is the, the gliders are the, the the glider community is is uh, also diminishing so to say and this could be also one of these game changers for that so, so we are definitely looking upon that and, and also electric flying for flight schools and so on, but definitely for aero clubs. Hans, so, thank you. I really like the idea that is attractive for, uh, for women. female part of I, pilots. I, I, I just want to say, if you want to attract uh, women, buy an electric aircraft. That's a new slogan. <laughs> okay, okay. That's, a, that's a good point. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I have, uh, because I think we, we, are, we don't have much time left because we're already quite longer than we were playing. And I know you're probably also busy as we are still on a Friday. Um, so um, I want to have a last round of questions or comments. If somebody, uh, I ha still have some questions on my list, but perhaps uh, you could, uh, you could uh, say which are the most important points for you. We start with Hans then Eric, then Martin, and then Jinin. Yeah, well, we, we see Lupon that the battery issue is definitely something. Therefore, we are in our project now cooperating with Siemens in Trondheim, and we will also cooperate with Rolls-Royce in Trondheim, which are developing the part of the EFNX project. We are also wanting to, uh, well, we are having a dialogue with the Swedish Northvolt, which is a battery producer. And also, I see a Brown Boveri, which is one of those charger, charging providers and well, electric providers. And having a dialogue, could we uh, get their interest in towards aviation also? And we, we'll, we see that there are possibilities to do this. And, and so therefore, this is a cr very crucial question to, to develop batteries towards this relatively small sector that aviation is. Now they are concentrated on developing uh, batteries for the well, for cars, uh, as there is the big money and the volumes. We can never be, become as rich in volume, but, but we can definitely become of interest. And, and it's a necess well, necessity for us. And I stop there. Okay, so perhaps Eric? Well, <clears throat> uh, to, to summarize things, I think that uh, Norway wants to take the lead position by uh, by having a market that is relatively clear and defined and the government has put effort into this report and uh, there will be uh, more initiatives coming out of Norway for the next year. Uh, I think it could be a good thing if I send you the uh, report. There is an English uh, summary of it uh, will uh, at the end so you can put it on your web page or so. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't have anything else yeah, to add. We definitely will do, and we will also pu publish part of the summary in our magazines. Uh, so we will have a link there. And uh, so now, uh, perhaps uh, first Jinying and then uh, Martin as final comment. Jinying? Okay. Um, yes. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, we hear you. Uh, what since we are in in the business of electric propulsion, we strongly feel the unbalance between the eVTO uh, and uh, the regional or commuter aircraft. That means there is a big hype on the eVTO, while uh, the perspective is rather 
yeah, it's more futuristic, futuristic, but however, the challenge is much higher and also the impact, I don't know if it will have such an impact like an electric commuter aircraft. So, um, we, so, so we feel that the commuter aircraft will be realized much earlier and have a, will have a bigger impact, but somehow this is not reflected in the public interest and also invest, investor interest. So I think this could be a um, very critical aspect that for example, Norway or Sweden, uh, let's say, uh, take money in the hand and drive uh, this kind of business. It's, this would be very essential because without investment, um, I think the business will not de develop so fast. I can comment that I totally agree with you. Uh, there is a lot of EV tall stuff, but, uh, but there is a lot of more business cases with fixed wing, I think. Yeah. And for also from the complexity of the electric propulsion or power distribution unit and so on, uh, considering the current certification requirement from the special conditions, um, this is much more challenging, but however, it's more, let's say, sexier than uh, our commuter aircraft, so everybody is run into that. Um, but let's see how we can push this commuter business market. Okay, Martin? Well, what to say? I, uh, I, I have to agree because as you can see, even if we started in 2010 without any investment or bank loan and everything, it took a long, long time to be where we are now. So I fully agree that uh, it's a little bit too much focus on this EFTOS and everything, even if the battery is not yet that good for to really make it that's my just my opinion that it's difficult to make it safe, this EFTOS, etc. And if we start with something more simple, we can fly already. Okay, so uh, thank you. Xin, do you have any final comments? Yeah, uh, yeah actually, perhaps uh, I just have a very quick comment. I think perhaps I can give some credit to eVito that we all, I think um, we all agree that there's uh, perhaps too much this investment hype in EV2. However, I think uh, as an electric aviation community as a whole, we perhaps can all give some credit to EV2 because um, as we all, uh, because I think uh, electric aviation really uh, uh, attracted people's attention, uh, the whole uh, society attention ever since Uber published this uh, white paper for EV2 in 2016. And I think that that's really the, you know, the, the credit they, the EV2, um, uh, guys reserve I think and as a whole I think in the end um, the whole electric aviation community will benefit from the tech uh, the, the technology um, generated by eVito because everyone can benefit it like the battery supply chain um, and the, the um, autonomous flight technology everything so I think um, yeah as a whole electric aviation com community is really uh, like a family Okay, so thank you very much all. Uh, uh, so I have to finish as you know, we're all uh, sending in, there is my son, our, one of the future pilots. Uh, so for him, we're going to build the electric aircraft because we don't know when they will come. Uh, and as we both, most of us are working in the home office now, uh, I think I have to stop here and we have to stop here. But stay tuned. Uh, we will get more information in the future, uh, you at the screens at home, and I hope I will have uh, some of you or all of you in a future discussion again. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Uh,